trying to get my kids uh, a toy, uh, I decided to give them chicken pox. Let's give, some, let's give my kids some chicken pox. Well, yes, uh, there are many notable ones, but the one that's sort of almost a sort of saint-like, really, okay. is probably uh, Joseph Lister. Lister. Because, uh, Lister's obviously key to the development of antiseptic techniques yes. in the late, well, in 1860s and 1870s, and he really is the person we identify with as, as who developed uh, techniques that, that, that reduce the number of the deaths from secondary infections. So he's, you know, he's absolutely monumental as an individual, but there are lots and lots and lots of others. And um, I can think of uh, people like James Young Simpson, of course, who really kind of discovered the, um, if, if you like, the uses of chloroform as an anaesthetic. He can think of uh, Robert Liston, who was one of the early um, uh, operators on, uh, who used uh, ether as an anaesthetic, we, um, James Syme, who was a, um, a, a famous um, pre-anaesthetic surgeon, and I uh, just happened to be Lister's father-in-law as well. But, um, and also people, when you move into the 20th century, like Gertrude Hertzfeld, who was one of the, the first women to take up a uh, seat at the college and then became a really big name in paediatric surgery. And oh, folks yes. like that. So there's a big, big uh, LC English who's fam famous, it was a licensee um, and uh, was famous for uh, starting the Scottish Women's Hospital. So men and women, really. Of uh, course. Uh, and well, they have the long history. history. Yeah, that's right. In <laughs> yeah. yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about the, um, I'm probably pronouncing it wrong, yeah. the W O H L wall? The Wall, yeah, the Wall Foundation okay. it, yeah, yeah, it was, well actually is a foundation, a trust really based in, in London and the reason why it's called the Wall Museum is okay. yeah, that part of the museum is because we did a redevelopment about three years ago okay. and uh, they were a, um, a big funder of that, of that uh, uh, area and also they do uh, funding for scientific research and things like that. So Maurice Waffle was the original uh, founder of the trust and it's oh, named after her. Yeah. 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 Now the, uh, the actual location, is this uh, the actual location of a, a surgeon's hall? Is that why it's called a surgeon's hall? Uh, no. Well yes, I mean um, what you need to realise is that the Royal College of Surgeons um, has existed really, as I say, as the incorporation of other surgeons. And its first home, in a way, was a house okay. in another part of town. Um, and they moved about quite a lot. And then there was what was called the Old Surgeons Hall in the late 17th century, which is down by the Flodden Wall. And it, it's still part of the university. The lower part of the building still exists. But it's not until 1832 that this building was um, created, um, it's actually originally uh, there was a sort of set of riding stables in this area, but um, the land was bought because, and this is where it gets complicated, people collected medical specimens because they wanted to show unusual pathologies, and that was the only way of learning about it at that time. Was it grave, grave digging? Uh, well, that's, uh, well, that's sort of part of it. But, um, <laughs> get to that, but the, the actual um, specimens were previously collected and the college recognised that to be an internationally fam uh, famous institution it needed its own collections because that's what you need to demonstrate. Collections had a value and people wanted to either sell them to you or you know, they wanted to be credited for having donated to them. And a particular individual called John Barclay um, offered a large collection to the college, but as long as we built a building for it. <laughs> and I mean, typical style, as many of these institutions were, they, they did, he died and they still haven't built a building for it. And it so they, uh, they faffed around a little bit longer and eventually, um, Robert Knox, who was the, what was known as the college's first conservator, decided to, now push it forward and along with the John Barker collection and another collection which they bought by, from a guy called Charles Bell, they had a big collection which they had to create a building for. So in 1832 
this is this building was finally finished and that's when the collections were installed so it was always set up as a sort of teaching institution using these collections but um, that wasn't separate from the museum at that time it was considered to be the museum was considered to be part of a teaching device if you like and that's what they uh, created and then from that that, that stage on it was used um, it was open to the public in the 19th century on, a, on regular occasions but generally it was to encourage medical students to come in and, and train.